This podcast is made possible in part by amazing, wonderful, incredible patrons like Lisa Mueller. Thank you so much for joining Lisa. Uh, Lisa joined the $3 a month plus alpha tier. So she gets access to uh, Japanese plus alpha, the podcast about the Japanese language that I've produced uh, something like 16 or 17 episodes of, I think. Um, So the back catalog is there for anybody that wants to join. Thank you so, so, so much, Lisa. Uh, Also, um, so we we do have the Patreon. That's japankyo.com slash Patreon. But one of the listeners, Rod, hey, Rod. So one of the listeners emailed me and said, you know, can you set up a Kofi? Um, that's ko-fi.com because uh, some listeners might not want to join the Patreon and pay monthly. Some just want to send a quick lump sum, uh, maybe, you know, three bucks or 10 bucks or whatever. Uh, and, and so that, that made perfect sense to me. And so Rod, thank you so much for the suggestion. I set up the Kofi page. You can now go to ko-fi.com slash japankyo and you can buy us a kohi as i say in japanese <laughs> and rod right away he bought like i think five or six quote-unquote kohis and um thank you so so much rod rod is very uh, active and he sends a lot of emails and he's given me great suggestions for ichimon japan and we've done episodes based on his suggestions so thank you thank you so much rod if you want to buy us a kohi you can go over to ko dash fi.com slash japankyo link in the show notes and if you want to join the patreon go over to japankyo.com slash patreon welcome to japan station a production of japankyo.com i'm your host tony vega Just a few quick things, and then we'll get into the uh, main part of today's episode. But first of all, I got to remind you about Japankyo Docs. That is our new YouTube channel that I'm running with Kyle from the Tokyo Explosion podcast. He is an amazing uh, filmmaker, videographer, editor. I I don't know all that stuff. He is amazing with the camera and with the visuals. Um, And I'm doing my best to support him in every single way. I'm doing the subtitles. I'm trying to find as many guests as I can. And we are producing stuff that I am very, very, very proud of. We have three full videos out right now, and we are releasing one video every two weeks. The latest video as of the time of this recording is with uh, Aya, or well, her name is Ayako. Um, She was a hikikomori for a while, and then she decided to open up a lesbian bar, and and she has a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful story. And I am so honored that we got to share her story with everybody that's watching. And, And by the way, I know that there's a lot more people downloading Japan Station then have subscribed to the YouTube channel. So if you haven't done that already, please, please, please go do that. It's a big difference. So go do that. Hit that subscribe button. And while you're at it, please leave us a review, a rating, uh, subscribe to the uh, podcast here over on Apple Podcasts or whatever your platform is. Uh, for example, on Apple Podcasts, we only have 12 reviews. I, I, I mean, come on, we can do better than that. You can you can leave a nice little review there. I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. All right, so go do that. There will be a link in the show notes. And of course, the YouTube channel, you can go check it out over at japankyo.com slash YT. And the name is Japankyo Docs if you just want to look it up. All right, so my guest today is Dr. Wesley Robertson, or he tends to go by Dr. Wes Robertson. Uh, He is a lecturer over at Macquarie University in Australia, and he specializes in in linguistics, but specifically the Japanese language and its writing system. He has a book called Scripting Japan, Orthography, Variation, and the Creation of Meaning in Written Japanese. Now, if you're a longtime listener of this show or the other podcast that I do, Ichimon Japan, or if you're one of the patrons with access to Japanese Plus Alpha, the other podcast that uh, is exclusive for the patrons, uh, you know uh, that I absolutely love talking about the Japanese language. I graduated with a master's degree from the University of Hawaii uh, in Japanese language and linguistics. So I absolutely love digging into the nuances and little details of the Japanese language, whether it's the writing system or spoken or whatever it is. And so it was an absolute delight to get to talk to Dr. Robertson about his book. Um, As the title implies, right, it's basically about the Japanese writing system. And the Japanese writing system is super, super interesting because there's 
three or four um, writing systems, depending on how you count it, you know, whether you count Romaji or not. And then maybe you count the numbers too. And and yeah, anyway, so it, it's, it's kind of complicated, but it's also really, really interesting the ways in which people use these uh, writing systems in order to convey meaning. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. We're especially going to focus on katakana for like, uh, <laughs> as it is used by foreigners depicted in manga and, and media in Japan, but a, a bunch of other really, really interesting stuff. So I hope you enjoy it. Here is my conversation with Dr. Wes Robertson. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. What what got you interested in in the Japanese writing system specifically? What was the kind of thing that made you think like I, I I'm gonna write about this? I'm gonna research this specific area of the Japanese language. I mean, there's there's the initial interest in the writing system, and then there's when I actually decided to research it, which were kind of separate. Uh, so. Mm. I, as many Japanese learners, when I started learning Japanese, I didn't know there was any real flexibility in the writing system. I was told that you write this word in this script, this word in this script. Uh, and I had the uh, incorrect assumption that every time I learned kanji, I should just use it whenever I could, right? So uh, you mm. learn new kanji, you use it, right? Because originally you're just yeah. using hiragana, not because it's what you're supposed to use, but because you don't know the kanji. So, you know, I, right. I learned these obscure kanji and start using them and, and not realize that that wasn't maybe the best thing to do all the time. Um, but I, I had a translation project. Uh, for my capstone mm -hmm. in my undergrad. And there was this poet, uh, Takahashi Mutsuo, who writes some really fantastic stuff. Um, uh, and he likes to use really, really obscure kanji. Um, and <laughs> sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes there's a quote-unquote reason and that you can type the obscure kanji in and, and in like Word or look it up in a dictionary and we'll say like, this kanji has this like implication. You can go, oh, okay, okay, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the kanji he's using, like he would just write words like doko in kanji, I remember there's a really obscure kanji for the verb ukabu to float that he uses uh, that took mm. me um, – this was over a decade ago, so the internet wasn't mm. as good. It took me uh, over a week of, of trying to find it, to be honest. It wasn't <laughs> wow. like – it just wasn't included in anything. Um, yeah. And I was like, you know, why? Uh, and at the time, I was just kind of frustrated by it because I had to translate this. I was like, you, I just spent a week looking up the word to float, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I did <laughs> – I did note that like there was some motive. I, I couldn't unpack it. I didn't have the Japanese ability. I was just a fourth year in uni. Um, mm -hmm. And I mentioned it in like, my final presentation, the translation class. Like Something's going on here. I have no idea how to translate it. But there you go. Um, and then I went to Japan, mm -hmm. and I started to see more things. And I saw uh, a big one that stood out was there was a McDonald's mascot at the time. Uh, they had this range of American burgers, uh, which were like Texas themed mm -hmm. or Florida themed or whatever. Oh yeah. I remember those. I yeah. Think I was probably in Japan around the same time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They were bad actually. Yeah. Some of them, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they had this mascot called Mr. James and he was dressed as like a, a huge nerd, basically like a comb over, um, you know, really, <laughs> uh, unflattering, yeah. um, pleated khakis kind of thing. And they had him speak mm -hmm. entirely in katakana, like on advertisements and, and posters. He, his, Japanese being katakana, right? And yeah. I was like, why is that? And Japanese friends would say, oh, it's because he's speaking with an accent or something. And I was like, well, how can katakana convey accent, right? Because mm -hmm. if I write konnichiwa in hiragana or katakana and just have like a computer read it out, there's no, it's not like a phonetic change, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. ah is mm -hmm. ah, ka is ka. Um, mm -hmm. And that's actually kind of an ignorant question because when you really think about it in English language comics, font and color and stuff absolutely are interpreted as accent. Sure. Um, but mm -hmm. it did get me thinking about it. Uh, but then again, I, I just kind of stopped thinking about it. Like I noticed uh, advertisements that were using kanji in weird ways. I noticed, you know, uh, you see vending machines within the same block radius and one has tobacco in katakana, one has it in hiragana, <laughs> one has it in kanji. True. And it was kind of like, yeah. okay, this is weird, um, but whatever. And then I, I initially went to um, my master's degree to look at how Japanese people um, edited their own English when they're non-native speakers. That was my initial idea. But huh. I ended up doing uh, a coursework assignment and they said, do like a small scale study uh, and, you know, don't involve ethics because um, that takes too long. We need to get you. Just yeah, speed, it takes, you know. it's a headache to get approval. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is just a final assignment, right? Do something you can do with yeah. no with just the data that exists in the world. Uh, so I ended yeah. up like just doing a quick little research project on 
uh, the use of katakana in the comic uh, My Darling is a Foreigner. Because I just had it sitting mm-hmm. around, and I was like, you know, this is kind of interesting. I could look into this. This would be a little project. And I, I did mm-hmm. a reading here, and I got like a really good reviews from my teacher, and they said, you should expand on this. So I was like, well, that's not really what I want to do. And then I thought about it. I was like, well, maybe it is kind of what I want to do. And then I had this kind of rush back of all these memories I just told you. I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. you know what? I would really like to understand all this. So mm-hmm. I sat down and started a master's degree, master's, uh, my master's thesis. Uh, it mm-hmm. was pretty well received. Um, it was just on the mm-hmm. use of katakana in non-native speech. Mm-hmm. That was the only focus. And mm-hmm. so I was like, this was kind of cool. Uh, I should I should keep going to this. I bet there's more to figure out. And then I kind of expanded yeah. that into my PhD and just kind of moved forward. Uh, I realized that there'd been a lot of research on script, but not uh, – I mean, this is going to sound arrogant, but I didn't agree with it. I, I didn't mm-hmm. – um, I found that the conclusions were – and this is something that uh, linguistics in general, especially – before the 2000s, if I'm, uh, but it, it can always happen, uh, has had mm-hmm. an issue with where the meaning is kind of judged by the author as a native speaker, being like, I am a native speaker, therefore I know what this means, kind of uh, thing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. that doesn't mean that they're wrong. Um, I think mm-hmm. a lot of their arguments might be right, but mm-hmm. they might not. And so yeah. I tried to take some sociolinguistic stuff that I've been reading at the same time that I found was really interesting and apply that mm-hmm. to the Japanese writing system to kind of expand on that. And look into it and then just kind of snowballed from there. And and uh, surprisingly, there's been more to say for the last uh, few years. So I've, I've kept talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's really nuanced. I mean, like it, it's it's and, and your book, you know, addresses a lot of the things. It's not just like, uh, you know, this equals this. It's mm. like in this case, it could mean this. But mm. if this kind of person uses it in this kind of situation, then maybe it gives off this. But then if a certain kind of person <laughs> reads it in a certain kind of context, then that same meaning can be interpreted a different way. <laughs> right, right. Like the, the way that we use script, uh, the way we use anything, um, any language yeah. uh, exists in society right so even if yeah. you know even if we do say okay like hiragana is cute is is a big stereotype right and so yeah, let's say yeah. somebody's like i want to convey cuteness so i'm going to use hiragana uh yeah. to convey cuteness and it's like absolute and you go okay yeah. okay that definitely aligns with the argument that hiragana is cute but then you have the interpreters right and that's yeah. the that's the other factor like even in that case where it's like no i'm not trying to convey anything socially significant i'm just trying to convey a cute feeling well yeah when you try to convey a cute feeling and somebody doesn't think you're conveying a cute feeling, then they think you're someone who uses hiragana to be cute and they have an assumption of that identity, which can result yeah. in an interpretation not only of the text as failing to be cute, but you as someone who's trying too hard to be cute. And it, you know, it results in this <laughs> yes. whole – in the same way that, you know, like like uh, a simple example in English, right? you swear. Why? Uh-huh. Someone might think, oh, it's because you are a bad person. Well, it's like that wasn't my intent. Uh, but you are yeah. trying to be vulgar. It's like, well, that wasn't my intent. You overheard me. Or maybe I was trying to be vulgar and you're like, oh, that's cool. You know, you're a cool swearing person. Like all these things exist in society. So even if we do it for one motive, um, because we don't have control over interpretation and because people, you know, see things in different ways and they have different encounters with hiragana. Uh, yeah, somebody yeah, yeah. maybe met someone who uses too much hiragana and didn't like that person. And that you know clouds their view of hiragana use. Uh, all these things yeah. complicate it and make it make it a really uh, fun and, and interesting. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, we yeah, can't yeah. say this is why it happens. One reason. But uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but hey, that, 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 I mean, it can be a headache, but it can also be very fun <laughs> and it gives us stuff to talk about. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Most things that are fun, I think, can also be a headache. That's what, you know, makes yeah. it difficult enough to be fun. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So let, let's go back to the, the foreigner thing that, mm-hmm. that you mentioned. And it's, it's something that I've seen too. Like a lot of times, you know, you'll see, uh, that a lot of times they're the very stereotypical kind of foreigner character and then you'll see them use katakana, but it, it, it's, it's um, perhaps those are some of the most, um, how can I put it? Visible examples, yeah. but there's a lot more to this than just that. And, and you have one chapter in the book that really digs deep into this. Um, I don't know. Could you give us a better idea of like what's going on with these characters? How, how is Katakana being used in these cases? So as I mentioned, um, when mm-hmm. I first encountered this and I asked Japanese people to describe it to me, they described it as accent. Um, mm-hmm. And my question at the time, uh, as I, again, as I mentioned, was just like, how can Katakana, how can a, a graphic change not a spelling change, but a graphic change, convey accent. And I've described mm-hmm. that as, as both a good question and a bad question. And it's a bad question because it's been answered. Again, uh, in English, in 
you know, uh, comic studies has shown well and far that you do not need to actually convey the sound of something to get people to read it in a sound. Like you can mm. write uh, a French speaker's English in like a, a font that looks French-ish, if you will, <laughs> or a German-ish, and people will be like, oh, okay, that's accent. Like, so that, that can actually happen. Um, mm-hmm. But it is a good question because it got me to look into this, and I did mm-hmm. a deep dive into uh, some comics, and I basically looked, okay, where is Katakana being used? What is it being used for? And I interviewed some of the authors as well, and uh, you know, a lot of them said accent is a thing. So like their, their intent in some ways is to convey accent. And certainly non-native speakers are stereotyped as having uh, an accent or, or speaking mm-hmm. in a way that is somewhat, you know, different from how natives. I, I certainly still speak with some accent, at least, uh, mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. over 10 years of study. So sure, sure. But I constantly found that in all these comics, uh, being a non-native speaker and even being a non-native speaker who's not very good at Japanese was never enough to guarantee that katakana would be used. So there are always mm. like overrides. Uh, in one comic, if you are a non-native speaker, but you're also supposed to be like a scary villain, you didn't mm. get katakana, but you did get grammatical uh, you know, mistakes. Uh, in another mm. comic, if you were a non-native speaker, but you were also like extremely pretentious – you didn't get mm-hmm. katakana, and instead you got things like no-yo that are uh, – like the sentence final particles, no-yo, that combination that has been for you know decades now in, in sociolinguistic research in Japanese associated with kind of pretentious upper-class uh, female speakers, especially in comics where very stereotypical mm-hmm. forms of language are being used. Right. Um, and in other ones, you know, characters would – get really, really good at Japanese, and then for some reason their watashi would be in katakana. In one case, even when they're flashing back to scenes where the speaker is speaking in their native language, before they ever learn Japanese, the watashi was still in katakana. Um, mm. And this question, like, okay, if it's accent, how can one pronoun mark <laughs> accent, right? Especially when it doesn't right. appear in the majority of statements. Um, why is mm-hmm. it that some words are quote-unquote accented and others aren't? And so even though the motive in some cases might be accented, what I eventually argued was that uh, what we're seeing is the marking of characters that fit within the author's conception of a normative non-native speaker identity. And this is uh, something that differs from Japanese interpreter to interpreter, but generally was seen as kind of being uh, non-threatening, uh fun, well-meaning, but kind of bumbling, you know, making mistakes in Japanese society. And this isn't, of course, an absolute. Uh, I'm sure that Mm -hmm. there is a comic out there somewhere where every single character's percentage of katakana in their speech relates exactly to their Japanese level. And I'm sure there's another one that just every single character has katakana. But it came up Mm -hmm. time and time again that there were exceptions. And when characters failed to perform this kind of identity, uh, it resulted in the loss of this kind of katakana marking. And so I ultimately argued that accent is being interpreted uh, secondary, whereas the identity that's being evoked is kind of the primary one. And of course, the identity would have accent, right? It is a non-native speaker-based identity. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I ultimately argue that this can even be seen in marking, for instance, of people who aren't fictional characters like Naomi Osaka, uh, because mm-hmm. she's had her Japanese marked in katakana uh, by mm-hmm. Japanese broadcasters. And I you know, incorporated in that chapter some quotes from uh, Japanese forums, Japanese online users who are saying, you know, uh, decide is she Japanese or not? Like, and they're right there linking it to the the choice of whether or not to mark the script being not based on whether or not she can speak Japanese perfectly, but whether or not she's Japanese, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. these kind of uh, the argument ultimately then is that katakana is is marking these social categories and is being used to convey information about which types of non-native speakers kind of fit into uh, which social categories. And even, of course, when katakana is necessary to readers, which may influence how they use katakana in the future. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Um, I mean, you just reminded me something with the... Well, okay. So uh, I, I'm in Hawaii where mm-hmm. there's a big Japanese... Uh, American population. Mm -hmm. And something that I've noticed is that sometimes, uh, like, first generation, like people born in Japan will write uh, the last names of the people, the Japanese Americans here in katakana, Mm -hmm. rather than in kanji. Yeah. Right. So that that's another very interesting little quirk. Like even though like the person here is uh Tanaka, you might see it written in katakana when somebody's speaking about a Tanaka that was born and raised here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean that's been famously done with um Ichiro, the baseball player. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Yoko Ono often had her name in Katakana. Uh, That's well known. Mm -hmm. Like the definitely this this using Katakana to make someone to question someone's Japanese-ness in a way. Um, mm -hmm. Or say like, okay, they're Japanese, but they're actually Hawaiian, right? That kind of – there yeah, are yeah. Um, nationalistic concerns that are involved as well. And of course the use of kanji as – I mean it is ironic from a, from a, non, from a non japanese uh, you know, native speaker's perspective. Uh, katakana mm -hmm. and hiragana might arguably be more Japanese than kanji in some ways. Um, but, <laughs> Good point, yeah. <laughs> but from the Japanese perspective, uh, katakana mm -hmm. is seen as you know, kind of non-Japanese. And the question of mm -hmm. what it means to be Japanese is of course again one that involves uh, ideology. Uh, looking at mm -hmm. Japanese history, who gets to be Japanese is something that has been uh, long a concern that has, you know, uh, resulted in people uh, who live in Japan uh, mm -hmm. being seen as, as you know, not part of the group. And now that we have, of course, people like Naomi Osaka, etc., um, the recent you know, guy who won the Nobel Prize, uh, mm -hmm. are, are they yeah. Japanese? Do they get to have their names <laughs> in kanji, right? Do they get to speak right without katakana subtitling these kind of questions uh, manifest in in more com even more complex ways yeah 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 um something that i that i couldn't help but think about was i mean you you mentioned how uh, at first uh it was explained like oh because the the katakana is mm -hmm. representing that they have an accent and so mm -hmm. i started thinking about you know how we do that in in i don't know a comic book or a book mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes you get like i don't know the german character or the french character that might use like ze instead of mm -hmm. like the right like you you will see it written out phonetically D do you remember seeing examples of of an accent trying to be like represented phonetically or or was that much rarer in japanese no, it was quite rare in Japanese. Um, so phonetically, I just I should take a step back. Just know that phonetically mm -hmm. is tricky because it never is perfectly phonetic. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you look into these respellings, which uh, there's some great research uh, out there on it, like um, uh, this book I think called Orthography and Social Action that uh, if people are interested in the English uh, space should check out. Um, it has things mm -hmm. about what are called I dialects, where you respell something but it turns out to be pronounced the same way, like W U Z for was. Like that doesn't mm. that's was right. W A S W U Z. They're both was, but they're mm. involved in even though they don't convey a specific sound, they signify to the reader, oh, this person isn't, uh, you know, a native speaker, or even oh, this person isn't that bright. Like there are these social mm -hmm. ideologies that um, standardized spelling is a marker of uh, yeah. intelligence, uprightness, nativeness, etc. In Japanese, mm -hmm. though, I didn't see much respelling. It's mainly done via script. Uh, grammatical errors, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Grammatical errors were quite common. Uh, and the misuse of kanji was also quite common. So using a kanji which has the same reading but uh, a different one. Like I remember uh, they had a French speaker whose Japanese is really good, but uh, they want to differentiate it in some way, so they had him – uh, speak in the wrong kanji. And actually, what's <laughs> weird is the characters in the comic could actually see the kanji. They could say, like, that's not the right kanji. And it's like, how do you know that? He's speaking. Interesting. Um, but like, unazukimasu, like, uh, to nod, but mm -hmm. can also mean to agree. Uh, he used mm -hmm. um, unagi. So the, the una <laughs> was represented by eel, right? Those kind of things. Uh -huh. So yeah, I did yeah, see yeah. katakana respelling, but that was only in one comic. Um, uh -huh. It seems like respelling doesn't happen that much in Japanese. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't yeah, know yeah. why. Maybe it's because it's moraic, so a respelling is a bit more of a jump right. than just changing one letter. It's a little um, trickier, yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to say it doesn't happen, but I, I definitely yeah. saw way more uh, script. And if it was a misspelling, they'd like turn it into katakana to kind of emphasize it. Um, mm -hmm. So things like that. But I, I did see grammatical errors, conjugation kind of uh, mistakes, uh, uh sometimes just like ways of saying things that weren't very natural that kind of that kind of stuff was much more common yeah it's it's tricky like i mean uh, i mean let, let's say like a, a stereotypical character you know like an american kind of speaking like horrible japanese with that watashi mm. something like that yeah, right yeah. you like the 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 coloration of the vowel is changing however the the japanese phonetic system is not really able to convey that no. coloration whereas in in english we have i don't know 5 6 7 different things that could be considered an a mm. sound mm -hmm. right so you you might be able to get something a little mm. bit closer so so maybe yeah. there's some technical angle to it as well. I did see some, I mean, you, you remind me with the Watashi thing. I did see some like mm. vowel extension, yeah, uh, like yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the Chowompu, the, the Katakana vowel marker, like being used irregularly. Right, right. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, there's a lot of uh, 
emphasis placed on the Japanese reader, like, look, I'm giving you a hint that this isn't, uh, you know, sounds like what you think Japanese sounds like. Figure it out on your own. Right. Figure, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Because like you'll have, you know, have Indian speakers, you'll have Sri Lankan speakers, you'll have English speakers, right. you'll have French speakers, you'll have German speakers, and they're all just konnichiwa and katakana, and they're not going to say konnichiwa mm-hmm. the same way. They're all going to, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. pronounce it in their own style, but it's just mm-hmm. katakana. And of course, this all, yeah. of course, does again, just like the respellings, though. Um, even if you're striving for quote unquote accuracy, right? Well, it sounds mm-hmm. different, so it does create a barrier, right, between mm-hmm. us and them. Be it respelling, mm-hmm. be it katakana, it's like this person is different, and that that mm-hmm. message is again that social message that gets wrapped up in the in the script change. Right. Um, so as for like the the research side of things, I mean, when when you're doing like a sociolinguistic kind of you know research like this, I mean, you'll you'll often do like you know a quantitative thing. You'll mm-hmm. you might do a survey. You might talk to uh, I don't know the the person that produced the media that you're analyzing. Mm-hmm. You you know you you take all these different things and you put it all together because no one thing can really tell you like this is exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. And one thing you did like you mentioned was you talked to like a bunch of manga artists. Like mm-hmm. was it easy to get in touch with with these manga artists? Were they very like forthcoming? How, how did that go? It was not easy to get in touch with them, but they were forthcoming. Um, mm. For anyone who is doing any kind of research, my advice is just try. Like the like the worst thing that mm. happens is they say no. Yeah. Uh, mm. Like so, I just I was like, you know what, I, uh, you know, dame moto de, right? It was just like whatever. Mm. Like if if they don't talk to me, then they don't talk to me. Womp exactly. Womp. Like you know, mm. it's like still I got my project. Um, mm. I'm glad they did because they I would have made some arguments that don't align with their thinking. Which is fine. Mm-hmm. Like I don't have to, you know, when you when you interview someone, you don't have to take their thinking on a hundred percent. And you can look mm-hmm. for places. It's especially interesting where their thinking doesn't match what they're doing. But because mm-hmm. I had that, I was able to say, okay, no, this was a typo. This was intended based on their mm-hmm. own statement, right? That was very mm-hmm. useful. But mm-hmm. I just um, so I I spent a long time writing these really big formal looking requests for interviews. Um, mm-hmm. you know, very official looking, had Japanese mm-hmm. speakers look them over and I sent mm-hmm. them off to the, the manga artists are generally quite private. Uh, yeah. and so I just sent them to the publishers and I was mm-hmm. just like, this is, they're not going to write me back. And they did, <laughs> they did write me back and they're like, yeah, okay. Oh, that's great. But none of them want, uh, so two of them were like, look, they, they're, they're down, they're interested, but they don't want to do it live. Can you send it via email? And I said, okay, sure. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. I, I just typed my questions up via email, included the the panels from their comics that I wanted to ask about, and sent it off. And they wrote me back really detailed answers and even let me send follow-up. Oh, nice. Although one did say no. One said, nope, not interested. So <laughs> uh-huh. two out of three. Okay. Hey, right? that's, and that's not, not bad. bad. Yeah. yeah. So it just yeah. I was just like not doing it. The only way to get zero out of three absolutely is to <laughs> not – do it do right it, yeah. so i yeah. tried and I, I i assumed i would get zero out of three and i got two out of three and so yeah, yeah, yeah why not yeah. why not yeah i think um I mean, but and you the, tried really hard i mean that's yeah, how you, yeah. You, you yeah so that helped a lot i'm sure and i think um <laughs> also that i aimed like the, the comics i analyzed aren't minor like people know of them but they aren't mm-hmm. like one piece or like you know yeah. demon slayer or something i'm not i wasn't trying to get the time of somebody who uh is like constantly under demand based on their popularity right. So I think that mm-hmm. helped a little bit too that they were successful but not like you know world renowned. Um, mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I imagine if I tried to interview like the writer of One Piece or something like that, that wouldn't have uh, gone no as well. Time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he probably doesn't have time for uh, some random grad student. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another interesting section in the book um, is a little bit later, and in, in, uh, it's like talking like an Oyaji. I think is, mm-hmm. is I think that's the chapter title, right? Uh, speaking, um, yeah, something like that. Using something katakana like, that, yeah. like an oyaji or something like that. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because that was a, a, a different angle to this whole like katakana and like different text usage. Could you explain a little bit of what, what you did there? So that was the that was the interpretation side, right? If I'm, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't remember my chapter name. That yeah, was okay. a, I was like a, you did like a big survey kind of thing, I think, mm. right? Yeah. So yeah. that was also um, basically I, I took a bit of a risk when I finished my PhD and that uh, everyone recommends that you publish a book like immediately. And mm-hmm. I didn't want to do that because my thesis, while I was proud of it, uh, it only looked at authors using script for fictional characters. And i that's half the story, right? The other half is, do readers actually care? Do they pay attention to it? Because uh, I, I, I figure if I want to make the claims that I'm trying to make in that book, which is that basically script in Japan, around the world, but especially in Japan, is language. And 
is therefore treated as language variation in the same way that accent or certain you know choices of words are treated. Mm. I needed mm. to show that readers are engaging in it, not just as, oh, yeah, there's hiragana here. That's cute. But like, oh, mm-hmm. there's hiragana here. This is a hiragana user. And I associate that with this identity. I needed to show that that was happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So and I didn't know if it would like, of course, the, a null result was possible. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I took a risk and I luckily still got hired uh, after, you know, a, a long job search as it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I got I told in every interview, like, look, I I have I know what the book is going to be. I need to do this study. And the minute you hire me, I'm going to start it. And I'm going to and I need to be hired because I need to be like, this is a study conducted by Wes Robertson of of this university rather than this is a study right. combined by Wes Robertson of, of sitting at home trying <laughs> to do research. So right. finally, uh, you know, uh, a, a university took the bait, if you will. Uh, they hired me and I just started it. So I, I developed the survey. It had a number of sections in it. Uh, it was a bit long, which is always a risk. Uh, the longer your survey gets, the higher chance people drop out. And people did definitely yeah. drop out. But mm. I wanted to see how people responded to script variation. And so there were a number of small questions throughout it. And the two big ones, though, were one where I said, hey, look, uh, some comics have uh, varying their pronoun script combinations. Like there's an Ore Katakana character and a Kanji Watashi character. Uh, what kind of character would you associate with this combination? And I threw like I think it was three or four random combinations at each person, uh, and had them write down just like free free association. What kind of person do you think would use this? And then mm-hmm. the second was that I took uh, three short um, Japanese texts that I found on a advice forum. So you know one to two paragraphs, very very short. Again, the longer mm-hmm. they get, the the bigger problems you have. And yeah. I made them. I made four copies of each one. The original minus anything that was self-identifying. Like if they said, I am 15 years old, I cut that out. Or like, I am mm-hmm. a girl, I cut that out. Uh, and then I made a version that emphasized hiragana, emphasized katakana, and emphasized katakana. And everyone mm-hmm. who took the survey got one version of each text. And I just said, free associate, which again was was a risk, but I didn't want to like lead them on, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, free associate, tell me who you think wrote this. Like, I, I said, you know, age, gender, et cetera, these are all good things, but just anything that comes up. And so they didn't mention like age. And I was like, okay, they didn't like feel comfortable talking about age in that case. Um, and I was lucky enough that the survey seemed to be of interest to people. I saw people actually talking about it um, mm. through um, like saying, hey, that was kind of cool, kind of interesting. Uh, and mm-hmm. I actually was able to maintain uh, above, a, you know, 100 respondents that went all the way to the end, which was really good, oh. uh, way beyond mm. what I expected. And mm. they gave really detailed feedback. And yeah, there yeah. were some that were like, there's hiragana here. So woman is like, okay, okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty, you know, stereotypical. But yeah. the, the complexities that I found, you know, I found people saying, mm-hmm. oh, this katakana in this version, I have no idea. I've never seen anything like this. But then someone else <laughs> on the same text would say, this kind of meaningless katakana stuff is what gyaru do. So this is a gyaru, right? <laughs> or like yeah. you saw, you know, one person would say hiragana, therefore it's a woman. Another person would say hiragana. Yeah. Uh, but given that they're using these other difficult words, they feel like uh, kind of this weird loser. Um, like one text, the hiragana increase actually increased the assumption that the author was male over the original and the mm-hmm. kanji and the katakana versions because yeah. it kept evoking this like male who lives at home in their 20s with no <laughs> um, work prospects. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like another a, text. Like a neat, though, I guess, huh? Yeah, yeah, like a neat. For <laughs> yeah. some reason, yeah. in that text, the hiragana mixed with the context of the discussion broke yeah. this neat image for a lot of people. And yeah. in another one, hiragana actually increased the assumption that the author was over 40 years old. So the quote unquote young childish script, right? Because they're yeah. like, the hiragana use here is inauthentic. It feels like an old person trying to connect with young people. <laughs> um, and then for the pronouns, I, I got some that again were straightforward, like, you know, uh, Boku and Kanji. Man, okay. Yeah, all right. But there were other cases where, like, um, Katakana combined with Boku was specifically linked to Otaku. Like, Katakana mm-hmm. on its own didn't do that, and Boku in the other scripts didn't do that, but Katakana Boku got Otaku. And Atashi in Katakana uh, got a number of people who linked it to LGBT individuals um, in a way that I argued is kind of the overlap of these. So, like, you have this image of Atashi. And within that, 
you know, uh, transgender individuals or LGBT individuals might be part of it, but it's not your first association. And then with Katakana, mm-hmm. you also have links to LGBT language users, but it's not the first link. But when they're combined, uh, the interpreters like look for a, a place of overlap between the mm-hmm. two – their understanding of the two language variants. And yeah. for that one, it would be, you know, LGBT for the Boku one, like Katakana being linked to Otaku. There's like one or two, like Ore, you know, got one mention of Otaku kind of thing. Watashi and Katakana, mm-hmm. again, like one or two. But or with Boku, it went up to like, you know, something like seven or eight. Um, and then again, Boku itself had like, you know, one or two in the others, kind of like maybe Otaku. But when they combine, yeah. they look for, okay, where's the where's the overlap point? And so the understandings of both these variants kind of being jammed together emphasizes certain interpretations that wouldn't happen otherwise. Uh, mm. So that was another thing that I, I kind of saw, right? It's it's uh, mm. the word being represented in the script can also affect the interpretation of why the script is being used. Right, right, right. Yeah. And and like the 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 topic that they're talking about and mm-hmm. like the 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 knowledge that the person has. For example, like if a person doesn't know that Gyaru do use a lot of katakana, they're not going to make that assumption. They might make a different assumption, right? Yeah, so it's absolutely. it's so complex. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is. And that's frustrating because like I know people will probably read my book being like I'm going to figure out uh what katakana means when it's used in a non-standard manner and I mm-hmm. I raise a lot of questions uh but yeah. hopefully you know they provide the ability to come up with a plausible uh, a yeah. plausible answer given the context right 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 sometimes yeah, yeah. the I best mean, there, you can there's, do there's some generalizations that you can make but again like mm-hmm. the more you dig the more you find like oh well actually like in this case it might be interpreted this way or this mm-hmm. way or this way whatever yeah um all right, so since you started this long journey into to all this, you know, Japanese script and 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 you know, thinking about why people do this and that, like, um, like has has it given you a new appreciation for the language? Like, how has your kind of thought process, uh, perspective changed over these? I, I I mean, I know these things take years to to put together. So, what what can you tell us? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, like personally for me, I I achieved some of my goals with the Japanese mm-hmm. language. Um. And like I, I don't work at a Japanese company. Um, mm-hmm. I could definitely improve my abilities in certain areas, right? Uh, but mm-hmm. I, I have passed the JLPT. I speak at a level where I can make myself understood. I can read mm-hmm. Japanese academic texts. I was kind of at a point where I was like really happy with it, and I worry that I would have therefore gotten bored. Like, what's you know, it, I, I didn't see myself working at a Japanese company. It could happen, but you know, it, it's hard to study for something you don't see yourself ever using or doing. Mm-hmm. Um. And so I was kind of at a point where I didn't know – I still really loved the Japanese language as someone that's that studied it for a long time and you know made it their degree. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know if I would have maintained that interest in it if I hadn't found something that uh, to me was really, really fascinating and couldn't be explained by anything that was out there before, right? Something that I could, I could mm-hmm. look into and find things that were – uh, new uh, arguments that were kind of new. Uh, as a scholar, mm-hmm. that's of course what you want to do. Um, mm-hmm. So when I started, when I first encountered the script variation, I found it frustrating because I was a I was a young, you know, a young. I was kind of a prescriptivist. I was like looking for you know rules. There are rules, and you follow the rules. <laughs> yeah. Why yeah. are the Japanese people not following the rules for kanji and katakana? <laughs> they, got and they, they got it all wrong. They don't know what they're doing, <laughs> right? Yeah, like I know. I'm I've studied Japanese for four years at university. Yeah. I know how to use the Japanese writing yep. system. You sure do. Um, sure do. Right. <laughs> And, you know, like that, that uh, going beyond that and, and, you know, moving into a more sociolinguistic perspective um, of how language, is, the, the variation exists and the, and the rules always are broken the minute somebody decides to disagree with them. And that disagreement mm-hmm. is not because they're bad and not because they don't know things. It's because they're making choices and mm-hmm. looking mm-hmm. at script as a choice. Uh, looking at variation in the Japanese writing system as a choice to me really, really I fascinated me, and I think is one thing that helped me keep my passion for the language because, mm. um, you know, not only when you learn new kanji, there's like okay, but who uses this, right? When you learn, yeah. you see uh, people playing with script in new ways, you think, oh, okay, you know, what's going on there? I, I recently uh, wrote a paper which should be out early next year. Uh, mm-hmm. Where young Japanese women were mixing marked katakana and marked kanji together, which I'd never seen. I always everything I'd seen emphasized one script, right? Like you put more mm-hmm. kanji in, or you put more hiragana in. But here they're mixing mm-hmm. both of them. It's like, oh, okay, what's going on there, right? There's these new uh, little fascinating things that that keep surprising me. And mm-hmm. I guess that's probably true for any academic is that you have to find a topic that keeps surprising you and fascinating you. And um, I'm really kind of happy I chose the writing system because it is something that keeps. 
like I don't know, like ten years from now, who knows what I'll be doing? But for now, sure. it's definitely kept my interest and uh, kept me interested in Japanese because I, I keep running into things that I don't fully understand, and that excites me and, and motivates me to kind of investigate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I didn't go on to PhD. I stopped after a master's, but mm-hmm. the whole sociolinguistic way of looking at Japanese and language in general just utterly fascinated me. And, you know, I got to a certain point in, in my Japanese where I, I could say pretty much everything I needed to. I'm, I'm certainly not perfect even to this day, and, and I have a long way to go. I think I can mm. keep improving. But I, I, I got to a point where I was very, very comfortable. But when I started looking at things from, um, you know, the sociolinguistic perspective, it started making me, like, ask, like, why are they doing this? Why mm. is ne being used here and yeah, here? Yeah. But there's something different about these two ne's, and mm-hmm. there's so much to dig into here and and i still just it's become a way that i think and like whenever i find something peculiar about the japanese language i immediately start thinking like oh this is like this way okay okay and then i start to like piece it together and it's just fun it's it's fun Mm -hmm. i enjoy it too so yeah i totally understand it's really difficult if not impossible Mm -hmm. to gain fluency to a point where like you know you're you know that what a native speaker does and so like when i started japanese of course i think a lot of people do that was my goal right is is Mm -hmm. i want to be fluent but i lost interest in that after eh, after a while because i got like you know i get into a point where also if if you end up imitating things the way that everyone else says them you start to lose a bit of your at least in my my feeling a bit of you know Mm -hmm. why language is fun like i don't want to sound like everyone else i want to sound like me and mm-hmm. in English, you know, I, I have my own turns of phrases and stuff that I'll use. Sure. And so in Japanese, if I use a turn of phrase that Japanese people probably wouldn't say but makes sense, then that's fun for me. And I don't, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I think it, yeah. I think once I lived in Japan for a few years, I started to realize that I like Japanese for using it. Right? I liked mm-hmm. using it and I liked expressing myself in new ways and, and you know, making – the language my own in a way um mm-hmm. and i didn't realize it at the time but that kind of killed a little of my, my motivation to like perfect my japanese obviously if yeah, i say something yeah, that no yeah. one understands <laughs> i want to fix that that's yeah. a problem but if mm-hmm. i say something that is uh, sounds a bit like englishy yeah. but does make sense and yeah, gets yeah, yeah. my feeling across then that's kind of cool and i like social linguistics yeah. because it looks at it like okay how do they use language individually? And when you see other yeah. Japanese people using language individually, you get insights into how you can use language individually. Oh, okay. Yes. That's what happens when I say ore. You know, that's what yeah, happens yeah. when I say ne. Uh, that's what happens mm-hmm. when I say no yo at the end of a sentence, right? These kind of things uh, circulate. Or these are some of the risks. These are these are the 10 possibilities that can happen when I right. use ore, right? So yeah, yeah. to me, that, that keeps the language interesting because it shows you new ways to personalize language. And yeah, yeah, yeah. If we're we're using language to communicate uh, to convey things about who we are, then personalizing it to me is, is really what makes it kind of fun and special. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I we could keep talking about that forever, <laughs> I think. But <laughs> let, let's finish things off with. Um, mm-hmm. I know you you do a podcast too, and it, it's a mm-hmm. pretty interesting uh, concept. So just in case any of the listeners might be interested, let let's tell them what 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 is your podcast about oh thank you very much yeah for uh, letting me self promote there uh <laughs> so um i have a podcast called lingua brutalica with the amazing uh dr jess bernie smith who's currently at monash mm-hmm. and basically um i've so i've been a fan of extreme metal for for quite some time and i stumbled across a japanese extreme metal band called gotsu totsukotsu that used uh kanji and katakana for their lyrics so hmm. they didn't use any hiragana like it, it was kanji and katakana right and mm-hmm. I was like, is that, are they, tr- what's, what's going on there, right? Are they trying to be metal? That excited me because it's like, okay, ooh, ooh, does katakana convey metalness? Hmm. That's mm. something I hadn't thought of, right? <laughs> and I, I showed Jess, who's also a fan of extreme metal, and she was like, you know, um, there's this Taiwanese band called Chthonic, and they also do some interesting things with script. And I was like, you know what? Um, what if we sat down and wrote a paper on this? Uh, and we investigated and we sent out, uh, messages to the singers of Gotsu Totsukotsu and Chthonic, again, just on a why not, and they said yes. Mm-hmm. So again, I, I encourage any budding scholars listening to this to just email people you want to talk to. Like, the worst that happens, mm-hmm. they say no. They said yes. Um, yeah. And so, so we started, you know, writing this paper, which uh, came out just a few months ago uh, in language and communication. And mm. as we did it, though, we realized, hey, there are, these are just two bands, uh, and no one's really investigated uh, the language use of extreme metal bands Mm-hmm. inside out like in the pacific so we've been mm-hmm. compiling data on uh, the philippines uh sorry not the philippines um 
excuse me, Indonesia, uh, Taiwan, mm-hmm. and Japan, and Australia. And mm-hmm. we're hopefully putting that together for a book that we'd like to see come out next year, but we'll see how that goes. Books take a while. Or sorry, next next year sure. uh, take a while. Mm-hmm. But we also realized that uh, in doing all this reading on extreme metal scholarship in English, there hadn't been much on language in English either. There'd been assertions like, you know, this is what's being done. This is why it's done, etc. But no one had mm-hmm. really been asking, not no one, but very few people have been asking uh, the the singers of these bands why they're making these language choices. And so mm-hmm. Jess kind of wanted to do a podcast uh, to sort of drop the ivory tower down a little bit, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, and kind of create something that might be of interest and accessible to metal fans rather than just academics. And we played with a few ideas uh, on how we were going to do this kind of metal podcast and ultimately came up with this idea of why don't we try just contacting them and, and seeing if they'll sit down with us and chat. And mm-hmm. so we're now, you know, coming up on 20 episodes, which mm. blows our mind because, you know, we thought, again, who's going to talk to us? And it turns out a I lot know, of people. Yeah. yeah. You would think um, like these these guys are like, yeah, we don't want to talk about, them, about what we do, you know, like, but hey. No, nah, and a lot don't. Yeah. We do a shotgun method. Mm-hmm. Like I'd say about a third of only about a third of our requests hit, but okay. that's enough. Um, we just hey, keep yeah. asking. And so we've been sitting down and just having these chats with um, musicians about why they make certain language decisions uh, with their music. Uh, you know, what's their goal? How do they write? And kind of compiling this sort of much more casual than we do in our, our real, you know, nitty gritty ethnic ethnography stuff. But mm-hmm. uh, hopefully that's something, you know, that people that enjoy music or language find uh, interesting and enjoyable. So, yeah, definitely check out Lingua Brutalica. We're on Spotify. We're on mm-hmm. Podbean. We're on Twitter. We're on YouTube. Uh, and mm-hmm. we just, you know, chatting with extreme metal artists about their music, what makes them tick, what makes uh, why they choose the lyrics they do. And hopefully we'll have some you know, uh, pretentious academic findings on that mm-hmm. coming out in the next yeah. few years that you can also uh, uh, check out um, with more, you know, citations and theory. But these are meant to be something that are uh, long. Uh, they have been, they are long, but something that is a bit more accessible to kind of the general, uh, the general right, listener. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, I, I will include the links to the podcast and the book as well. Um, oh, thank you. That'd be great. You know, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I enjoy talking about language in general but also of course the japanese language so mm-hmm. uh th- thank you for for coming on i enjoyed the book and uh hopefully uh some more people will uh take an interest in it because I, I think you know like 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 we've said you know it's like when you're learning japanese you see what the textbook says mm-hmm. and that's your world that's that's what you know you think that is what is the world but mm-hmm. there is so much more than that <laughs> yeah absolutely and i should stress that like the stuff yeah. i'm seeing in japanese is not restricted to Japan. Um, yeah. People in English are playing with, you know, font and script. Uh, examples is the SpongeBob meme, which uses upper or lower and case capitals, right? That's not phonetic, mm-hmm. but it conveys its indexing, as we say, sarcasm. Uh, there are phenomena like this. You know, uh, in Korea, yeah. you can play with script, like in a way similar <clears throat> to Japanese. There are language countries that have had old scripts and new scripts. The things we see in Japanese are happening elsewhere. But Japan mm-hmm. is really fascinating because you have to use three scripts just anyway. And so it opens yeah. up this huge door to look at things that we might see glimpses of here and there. Mm-hmm. But in Japan, we can see it just like blooming, right? Um, yeah, and yeah. so, yeah, I know like Japan, Japanese is often said to be a difficult language. And I guess, you know, certainly it's true. It has its complexities. But mm-hmm. I do hope that uh, Japanese learners, um, you know, especially those that read my book, etc. But just mm-hmm. anyone that's looking into it, uh, if you can get over that difficulty... Uh, it is really just a fascinating language that allows so much yeah. variation and play and and especially, you know, if you come from a, a Western background, new ways of thinking about just how to say things. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. I, I, I'd i love more people to continue to be fascinated by Japanese. It's it's it is a, a wonderful, uh, sometimes, you know, frustrating, but wonderful uh, language. Yeah. I mean, at, at the beginning, you go like, why three scripts? But then once yeah, you yeah. get used to it, you go like, no, there has to be three scripts. Yes. If we all go hiragana, it's like, a, oh, that's even worse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. No one no one that's studied Japanese for more than like two or three years uh, likes yeah. reading only hiragana texts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like sometimes when, I, when I, like a, uh, a Japanese friend, I don't know, I, I know it's happened to me at least once or twice where they might try to like write all in maybe hiragana mm-hmm. or something and go like, no, please don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's worse. <laughs> I mean, I make more mistakes reading uh, like children's books to my daughter that are in hiragana <laughs> only than like, you know, uh, when I'm reading an academic, you know, Japanese book, because you just you just right. don't realize where the, the words start and stop. So you have to like, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it's like, it, is this a why? Is this a ha? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You, you, when you're reading Japanese children's books for the first time, you, you stumble through mm. it like you barely can speak the language, and you're like, no, look, look, mm. I can, 
if this book Don't wasn't written for children, <laughs> I would I would be able to read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, all right, awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> Again, the book is called Scripting Japan, Orthography, Variation, and the Creation of Meaning in Written Japanese. So this is a book that I thoroughly enjoyed. I, I As you know, right, I, I really like reading about this kind of stuff and learning about the Japanese language and really thinking about it, especially from a linguistic and sociolinguistic perspective. Um, if you're not used to reading this kind of book, um, it might be a little bit difficult. It is a specialist book. But I think it is worth the challenge and there's a lot to learn there uh, because uh, as I was saying with Dr. Robertson and, and he kind of said it too, I think, but uh, you know, there's only so far you can go with the language. Yeah, you can keep learning words and stuff, but I think it's also really fun to kind of dig a little bit deeper and sometimes think about the things that even many native speakers don't think about and don't fully understand <laughs> because language is, is not really something we think about consciously most of the time. We kind of know what we have to do in certain situations, but when when somebody asks you like, hey, wh why did you say it that way? You might not be able to answer. And it's up to sociolinguists and linguists to kind of figure out why exactly we do that and to explain it in a way that we can all understand. And then we learn a little bit more about language in the process and how we communicate and how we think as human beings. So I love that stuff. But again, if you want to check out the book, of course, you can check the link in the show notes. You can go to japankyo.com slash Amazon. That will support the show. Won't cost you anything extra. Sends me a a couple pennies so that I can keep doing what I'm doing. All right. So please, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them over to mail at japanstationpodcast.com. Always love hearing from the listeners. Jillian, I enjoyed your last email uh, where you talked about something that you learned in Japanese plus alpha in the podcast that I do for the patrons. <laughs> and you actually saw it in real life or, or heard it in real life. No, I, I guess it was you saw it because yeah, anyway, yeah, but it, it's just fun when you notice these little quirks of the Japanese language, you see it in the real world and you go like, hey, Tony's not lying. <laughs> like This thing is a thing <laughs> so yeah anyway that's the for the patrons but uh yeah if you want to send me an email mail at japanstationpodcast.com remember to subscribe to the show and your podcast platform leave a rating and a review and of course follow on facebook twitter and instagram at japankyo news both facebook and uh twitter have been growing really quickly <laughs> a lot of new followers have been coming on so if you haven't done so yet jump on the bandwagon don't miss out go hit the follow button. And of course, thank you so much to You Know Me for providing the opening and closing song. That does it for this episode. The next one is in the works. I, I, although I, I kind of do have it recorded. The thing is that I may be traveling in mid-December for about a week. So I'm not 100% sure that I'll be able to release a second episode in December, uh, but I will do everything I can to at least... Uh, maybe get the episode out onto the uh, RSS feed. I may not be able to get a post out all over on the website. Uh, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that. Uh, but I will do my best to get one out on December 15th and that'll be the last one of 2021. Woo! Actually, we just hit a new anniversary in the show um, about a month ago, I think. So I, I believe this is year three. <laughs> I don't even know anymore, but I, I've been so busy. I haven't even thought about it, but yay, one more year of Japan Station. So thank you so much to everybody who's been listening, uh, especially to everybody who's been listening since more or less the beginning. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for leaving your reviews. Thank you for your wonderful emails. Thank you for everything. Uh, you know, it's like to, to know that so many people are listening to the show is just absolutely amazing. And, and all your support means the world to me. So thank you for an amazing 2021. And uh, let's keep it going in 2022. Uh, also, don't forget to check out the uh, latest episode of Ichimon Japan. It's about school uniforms, and there will be a new one coming out very soon. Um, and again, you can go find all that stuff over at japankyo.com, as always, right? I always say that, so <laughs> japankyo.com, that's where you can find everything. Okay, so thank you for listening, and remember, go find your miniature pony. Just do it!